I'm going to break partly the terms in which I agreed to mark the talk, and that is I'm going to start talking about energy as well as, uh, as, well as money, monetary economics from a non-orthodox point of view. So first of all, I'll talk about uh, something work I've just done recently. Well, it started two years ago, but the publication, the first publication came out at the beginning of this year in the Journal of Ecological Economics. And this is something I think is absolutely crucial, which is incorporating energy into how we model production. And it's become especially so since last year. They gave the Nobel Prize to Nordhaus for contributions in combining macroeconomics with ecology. Now that's a bit like giving a arsonist a, a reward for firefighting. When you look at what he's done, just to give you an idea of how extreme his neoclassical model is, he predicted that with a six degree increase in global temperature, the decline in GDP would be roughly 8.5%. Now of course a 6, .5, 6 degree increase in temperature, I'd need, a, I'd need an aqualung to be here and so would you. Paris, well I don't, how high is Paris above sea water, sea level? It might be Paris would survive, but if I was talking in London, I'd need an aqualung. We're talking 70 metres of sea. Now, how on earth anybody can say that is going to cause only an 8.5% fall in GDP says more about their methodology than it does about their, the, the nature of the climate. He even said, I think, a 16 degree increase in temperature would cause about a 15% fall in GDP, something of that order. That, that one I don't know. The previous one, six degree increase, eight and a half percent fall in GDP, is in a 2017 paper he published. Okay. So that is how extreme it is. So it's about bloody time economics did something to take climate change seriously rather than leaving it in the hand of in, insane models like the Ramsey growth model on which Nordhaus built those uh, comments along with the 6% rate of, it, of discount, which means 30 years in the future, who cares what happens to people? We're all going to be dead. We don't care about them. That's fundamentally what a 6% rate of discount means. So we've got to do that and bring economics and ecology together. I might have a talk about that halfway before we go on to talking about the macroeconomic work I've done, which is talking about the significance of banks creating money fundamentally, which finally neoclassical economists are starting to recognise, but of course, again, they're bastardising it with their own technology. So to talk about the um, incorporating energy, I think this is one of my favourite quotes, probably in the history of science, coming from a, a scientist who confirmed Einstein's general theory of general relativity by looking at the uh, precession of mercury and seeing the extent to which light was bent around the sun, which is one of the predictions of Einstein's theory, confirmed by Arthur Eddington. And he wrote a popular book for the public about the nature of science. And there's a wonderful little statement saying that if you have a theory which is criticised, uh, contradicts Maxwell, well, so much the most for Maxwell. That's in fact what Max Planck effectively did. Uh, if it's contradicted by observations, well, sometimes these experimentalists do bungle things. He said, but if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it to do but collapse in deepest humiliation. Now, fundamentally, that's the state of all economic theories, including post-Keynesian. Because if you look at the theory and the models of production we all use, they all pretend that you can create output without energy. Now, the laws of thermodynamics are not something that economists are exposed to, and I certainly can't claim to be an expert on these myself. But the basic concepts are the amount of energy in the universe, there, there are complications to this, but the amount of energy is fixed, its form can change, but the amount of energy does not. So you can neither create nor destroy energy, a conservation law to start the argument. Um, and the, um, I'll just go, go backwards a bit. There, there's a wonderful summary of these laws by uh, Arthur Ginsberg, uh, the, the classic uh, uh, hip poet from the 1960s and 70s. And he summarised that first law as, you can't win. Okay? The second law is, the, which fundamentally is known as the law, the law of entropy, disorder increases over time. In that case, you go from high frequency light to low frequency light. You go from ultraviolet to infrared, that sort of thing, over time. It's, and one way to describe it, it's, it's, again, it's not technically perfect, but it makes the point, disorder increases over time. So if you don't put energy into a system, it will become more disordered over time, not less disordered. Now, if you think about what production is, it's taking disordered material, raw materials, and turning them into finished products. And it's taking a fixed number of those and converting to more of those over time. So both the quality, the complexity and the number of goods are increased as a matter of 
course in a growing economy and we've taken that for granted without wondering what it means. And the third law is that if you want to convert 100% of the energy, uh, and the, way, the way that Ginsburg, um, the first, so the first law he translates as you, you can't win, the second, second is you can't break even. And the third he converts as you can't leave the game. Now it says what the third law says is if you can find a point in the universe which is at absolute zero, then all of the energy you're taking, making use of can be converted into work. There is no place at absolute zero. Therefore, there must be waste. Now think about that in terms of the neoclassical obsession with perfect this and perfect that and 100% you know, efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. This goes by the wayside. Those are nonsense com concepts. So if you look at any closed system, it degrades over time, necessarily. So the only way we get production is by having an open system. And the open system means we're exploiting energy which is landing on the planet for free. None of us built the sun. Okay? We may build nuclear power stations, we build coal stations to mine stored solar power over time. We're none, of us built, none of us built that energy, we simply exploit it, we're mining it. So we get more outputs over the inputs over time. The, the outputs them are more ordered, ordered than the inputs, but there must therefore be an external source. Otherwise, it just simply can't happen. And that drives a local decrease in entropy, which is what the economy demonstrates, but there must be a global increase at the same time. So there's an intimate link, in other words, between the economy and the ecology. Uh, and all existing laws, all existing models violate those principles completely. Now, if you look at mathematical models and economics, they fundamentally began, I'm not sure there's any earlier, Mark, you might know, but I, I don't. I think that's the earliest I know of, 1928, the Cobb-Douglas production function model. And what you have with inputs of labour and capital to produce output with constant returns to scale. The constant returns to scale thing is quite realistic. If you double the number of factories, you double the amount of output, factories and workers. That makes sense. There are economies of scale, but they relate to um, increasing the size of your factories rather than reproducing the number of factories. That was Koleski's point in the principle of increasing risk. So you have a function like this, okay, with, with the exponent summing to, to, to 1 over capital and labour. Now the Leontief of production function that most post-Keynesian used says that output is the minimum of either capital divided by capital output ratio or labour times labour productivity. And then you have a, a, a minimum function for that. Now they're both ignoring the role of energy in production and they see production as a function of labour and capital at particular points in time. Uh, there have been some attempts to model by putting energy there in as well. In the Cobb-Douglas form, I haven't seen any in post-Keynesian form. They certainly may exist. And you have therefore quite output is seen as a function of labour, capital and energy. And this exponents again are made sum to one. This is in Solow's work and, and Stiglitz and a few others back in 1974 responding to the limits to growth in an attempt to destroy the limits to growth study. Which by the way, if you haven't read it, you should. Feel you available on the internet. Now that's better because at least it says energy has a role, but if you use the same approach that neoclassicals take to the unmodified Cobb-Douglas where they basically use income distribution as an argument for the shares because that makes it cons uh, consistent with the marginal productivity theory of income distribution they believe in then you will set an exponent for energy of roughly 0 0.07. Now what that exponent means is that if you have a 10% fall in energy, you will get a 0.74% fall in output. Does anybody want to test that in France today? See what happens? Shut down 10% of the power, see what happens to output? 0.7%? That's bullshit. Okay, it's an Australian technical term. It's bullshit. There's no way that makes sense. Well, let's treat energy properly. And this is the I actually had this insight in Paris about two years ago because my good friend and fellow researcher in economics and energy, Bob Ayres, used to live across the road uh, near um, uh, Bon Sargent, the Bon Sargent uh, train station. So I used to visit there. His house was full of art and full of sculptures. And one day, walking back from the bathroom, thinking on these issues for some time, this little insight popped in my head. A machine without energy is a sculpture. A worker without energy is a corpse. So the proper form for considering energy is to say energy is an argument into labour and capital without which neither of them can produce any output. It's a critical input. Neither workers nor f f machines can function without energy. Give it a try, okay? That's one reason the gilets jaunes are on the street. They can't afford to buy enough energy inputs to keep themselves alive these days. So the simplest way to look at that is to say that the amount of the labour as a function of energy is the number of workers 
times the energy workers absorb, consume, multiplied by the ratio of that, the useful work they can do to that energy. Now, if you think about the amount of energy you're consuming, um, would anybody, you know the idea of 100 watt light bulbs, the old fashioned light bulbs? Okay, have a guess of how many of those, in terms of energy equivalent of the, the consumption, roughly how many of those an American worker consumes? Per day. Per day. Well, it's on, on a daily basis. If you had the lights running 24 hours, how many, how many 100 watt globes would you need? Okay. Something of that order, one, but in, in the order of hundreds. Now, how much energy do you think, in terms of an unskilled worker doing it, it's very, just a typical unskilled labouring job in a factory production line, how many light bulbs can that worker do per day? It's about one, about 90 watts. Okay. So the amount of energy we actually consume as workers, even though we're being ripped off compared to the capitalists, compared to the financiers and so on, the amount of energy we can actually put into work is about one hundredth of what we consume. So the, if you think about the amount of energy we're consuming, it's gone up through the roof because that's the fact that I can fly, you know, get a train here from Amsterdam to Paris in the three hours is an immense consumption of energy. Now, if I said that was, a, if I made that possibility to Napoleon Bonaparte in the opposite direction a couple of hundred years ago, I would have got the, what the cross of honour. God knows. Okay, we do it on a daily basis, not even thinking about it. But that's what is the major form of our increase in welfare over time, even though we can complain about the distribution of income now. Now, the same thing for machinery. Okay, and now we've got a problem. Okay, the number of machines. How do you count them? This is the whole Cambridge controversy thing. Times the energy per machine. Now, that's easier. If you go back and look at the machines that were being used at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you get a pretty good idea of how many how much energy they can consume. So there's the units of unskilled labour measured in hours per year, the energy inputs to the representative worker, and that's a more realistic thought than the representative household, by the way, because I'm talking in terms of the amount of energy that worker can talk put in. I'm talk, talking in the average 25-year-old, not Arnie Schwarzenegger at the same age. Okay. And the ratio of that useful work to the amount of energy absorbed. Now with machines, you've got the whole hassle about what the units are that the energy inputs to that machine, and to give you my favourite comparison is between the, the James Watt steam engine and Elon Musk's Falcon 9. The, the James Watt steam engine roughly consumed 10 tonnes of coal per day. The Falcon 9 roughly consumes, I think it's 9, but say 10 tonnes of fuel per second. That's about 20,000 20, times increase in the amount of energy that the representative machine, or the most advanced machine, at that time does. So that's an idea of the increase over time. And then the ratio of the amount of energy going in to the amount of work being done. Now, of course, in the case of that, that rocket, most of the energy is to get the, a tiny projectile into space. Okay? It took one of those to launch uh, one of Musk's Teslas, Musk's own Tesla, into outer space. So you get an, a ratio on that front. So let's elaborate that. Uh, L is easy to measure. Um, David Graeber makes an important point about the number of bullshit jobs that exist these days. Okay, so I'm pretending that doesn't exist. We're all supposedly working in productive ways, but you would want to narrow this down just to those doing actual physical work. And the combination of the, the amount of energy in times that ratio is fairly constant. That's roughly 90 watts, as I've said. It hasn't changed since the days of slavery. Okay. So call that a constant. Then you have the number of machines, which of course we have the issues of how do you measure that. Uh, and it mainly damages the marginal productivity theory of income distribution. Post Keynesians use K all the time. Okay? It doesn't have the same impact on doing it for neoclassicals because we don't believe that determines the distribution of income, whereas they do, which makes it much more crucial to them. Uh, um, but EK has risen, you can basically regard that having risen exponentially. You could take the power input as a, as a James Watt steam engine as one for E0 back in 17, I think it was uh, 1779 or something like that. Um, um, and then to so say it's been rising exponentially over time. And then that's a, the example I love, the, the Watt steam engine versus Musk's Falcon 9. And then the ratio of the amount of energy available to, to produce work versus the amount of energy needed to make the device itself and to maintain it, including depreciation. That fluctuates with the cost of energy, the business cycle and so on. So we've got a range of elements there can actually be tied into a whole lot of things. Technological change, 
capacity utilization, et cetera, et cetera. Now you put it into the Cobb-Douglas production function. What you get is you can pull out the Cobb-Douglas production function minus the A term. Well, that means that's the A term. Okay? That's the energy which is used by a worker, which is pretty much a constant. So you can just call that a, K, so a constant C, but times energy for the a representative machine times the efficiency with which that energy is turned into work. Now that means the solo, so-called solar residual, which is a big dilemma for the neoclassicals, which 85% of change in output was found to be sourced to the A term rather than the K or the L. Yes, Mark? I am. <laughs> I want to get this done first of all, Mark, just quickly. Okay. Um, so you can't get rid of it. And what you get is the cost share theorem is this, this exponent for energy is the same as the exponent for machinery. So if you set the exponent for energy to zero, you get a labor theory of value, which is nonsense. So that's, that's the, the basic idea that I want to give you as a researcher I think we should all take a look at. And when you apply it to the Leontief equation, when you use a capacity utilization term, what you get is a, an argument that is very consistent with work that physicists have done on the relationship between GDP and energy. So we get something which is compatible with the laws of, of the thermodynamics. Um, we get, i jump down through all these things here. We need history of economic thought on this. The physiocrats were right, and Smith was wrong. Physiocrats said land is the source of all value, value and land is the measure. They were talking effectively in terms of absorbing energy from the sun. They were right. Smith was wrong to say it was labor. We now redefine GDP as useful work. Define it in terms of fundamental human needs. So traffic accidents reduce GDP because they slow down movement. Okay? And we have SRAFA, which we also need to update because rather than a reduction to dated labor, we should be making a reduction to dated energy. And there's more homogeneity there that reduces in some parts the impact of the critique because it's, even though machines are heterogeneous, they're all doing the same thing, converting energy into work. So that's my end of that one, Mark. <laughs> you just jumped in seconds before. I know you were. <laughs> so that's, that's the basic story there. Uh, I might leave them. We'll come back and discuss that one later, perhaps. Do we do it later or now? Later. later, okay. So the main thing I've been doing for some time, and Mark and I have been jousting on this, is, is jousting the right word with your... <laughs> um, and also, because Mark and I did it in a very friendly way, I did it in a very antagonistic way with, uh, with Paul Krugman. And what he said at one point in that uh, abuse of me, I won't call it a debate, it was a little bit of abuse uh, for any criticism of the neoclassical theory, saying that I said creating money equals creating demand. He said that isn't right in any model I understand. And he's correct. It's not right in any model he understands. Because the models he understands are wrong. So I want to help out here and say why. Just imagine you have, and this is something Mark and I, the debates with Mark and also with, what's the, the young guy who was in, Freiberger? Brett Freiberger, Mark and Pally and so on. And out of this, I, I made some wrong statements about these initial ideas, but the debate with Mark, with, with uh, Freiberger, with Pally, got me to the stage where I wrote what I think is a, a, a absolutely correct argument about the role of credit and aggregate demand. So it's one of the cases where I can be slightly wrong in how I express something. Others come back at me with criticism. We finally produce, I think, an improved argument. So I mentioned a three-sector economy, where each sector is spending on the other two. I want to call this a Moore table after Basil Moore. <laughs> I shouldn't say that in public, sorry. Uh, good friend. <sighs> and uh, it, it's a thing, I've been using this table for a number of years, but for, um, I'll name it after Basil when I get a chance to build it to Minsky. Sorry. <laughs> <sighs> so the basic idea is. Your expenditure is somebody else's income, okay? What you spend becomes income for somebody else. That's the total given. All theories of economics have to do that. And Brett's comment about that 
saying that I was breaking that rule is part of what led me to arguing that I can actually make that rule correct while including credit in that debate in the review of um, Keynesian economics. So what I'm going to show in expenditure is every row sums to zero. On the diagonal you have the expenditure by a particular sector. On the off diagonal you have who receives that expenditure. Necessarily the rows sum to zero. The columns can be non-zero because sectoral incomes can differ from expenditures. So I have three arrangements I want to look at. Say's law, fundamentally, inverted commas, because it actually reverses Say's law. Rather than supply creates demand, as demand creates supply. No lending is possible. All money, that you simply spend the money that exists, you can't borrow it, you can't lend it. Loanable funds, which is the model that, King, uh, that uh, Krugman understands. We have lending between sectors. So what happens there is there's a financial transfer along the diagonal, and then the money transferred and the money increases the spending of the recipient and reduces the spending potential of the, of the, of the, uh, the lender. And then finally, bank originated money and debt. So I prefer to call it BOMB. We used to call it endogenous money, but I think BOMBED is a better acronym. Okay? And endogenous money only makes sense to those who know the debate in the first place, which makes it impossible to communicate the debate. But if you say BOMBED, bank originated money and debt, I think that communicates pretty effectively what we're talking about. In that case, a bank, which is a fourth sector, lends to one of the other sectors, which then spends. And I don't show its assets in the table because it just takes up too much room on a, on a PowerPoint presentation, but I will build that into Minsky when I get enough funding to build godly, uh, uh, more tables into Minsky. So I don't show its assets, I'm showing its liabilities and its equity. So here we have a more table for a no credit society called so says law. A, sector 1 spends A on sector 2 and B on sector 3. Sector 2 sends C and D on, the, on 1 and 3. Sector 3 sends, spends E and F on sectors 1 and 2. Now you sum the off diagonals, you have aggregate income. Okay. You sum the diagonals, take the negative, you have aggregate expenditure. They are necessarily equal and that's again Mark's point in that debate. Um, Brett's point in that debate. So if I then say either one, if I, if I simply aggregate them, what do I get? In this particular case, if I say each of those is the amount of money in existence times how often it turns over, which is Friedman's uh, uh, money, uh, money velocity argument, it's m times v, okay? That's all that can happen in that society. So Friedman's logic is relevant to a society where you can neither lend nor borrow. Now, and then the aggregate demand, that's the aggregate dam demand calculated, which is the diagonal, and the aggregate supply is the same thing. Now what about for a loanable fund society? Well in this case, sector one is by going to borrow L dollars per year from sector two and spend it on sector three. So sector two is going to be spending L dollars less per year on the other sector. Now it might be a change, the values might change because of this as well, but fundamentally that logic has to apply. And sector one because is lending, sector two is lending to sector one for interest payments. So there must be a stock of outstanding debt, which I'm calling capital L. So sector one has to pay interest to sector two as well on that money. Now you do that, and you do the simplification that I've done previously. Take the, the, the diagonal or some of the off-diagonal elements, and notice what happens. The credit, which is the L, cancels out. Okay, you get minus L here, plus L there. You get plus L, minus L here, plus L over here. Whichever way you look at it, the credit itself cancels out. So in a loanable funds world, there is no role for credit. And that's if the neoclassicals were right, that banks were simply intermediaries, they would also be right to ignore <coughs> banks' debt and credit in aggregate demand. Okay? What they're wrong about, slightly wrong, is notice the interest payments on debt turn up as part of aggregate demand. And that's an ag if I included interest payments by the bank on deposits, that would be there as a positive as well. Okay. So gross interest payments are part of aggregate demand, aggregate income, underloanable funds, which neoclassicals don't realise. But it's a minor modification. Okay. It becomes more important as debt rises, but of course at the same time its rates have been falling. So again, they can argue we can pretty much ignore that. So credit plays no role in loanable funds. What about bank originated money and debt? Well, in this case, there's a fourth sector now. I've got to bring a fourth sector, which is the bank sector. And it's lending L dollars per year to sector one, and sector one then spends L dollars per year on sector three. 
Of course, the bank's assets of L, capital L, rise. And when I get that chance to build this in Minsky, I'll make that a, a built-in feature of the, of the table. So I'm going to say L is the rate of change of debt, which is credit, and use that as a simplification. And sector one is paying interest to the bank of R times capital L per year on the outstanding debt of L. And then the bank is spending GHNI amounts on, those have got A, B, C, D, E, F, now I've got GHI as well, on sectors one to three respectively. So when I put this together, and I then do the same mathematical operation, and by the way, I'm using a symbolic logic program here just to make it obvious that I'm not making a logical mistake, okay, which is the typical neoclassical comeback to post-Keynesian work. You do that whole thing, and you find that aggregate demand and aggregate income include credit. You've got money velocity plus the interest you get credit, there's Milton Friedman. There's what loanable funds gives you. That's what the post Keynesian insight is. Credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. Okay? And uh, I'm going to be as uh, arrogant as one of our Antipodean friends here and say, I don't think, that's, you, don't think you can argue against that. But we'll see. Now, that's looking at the... The, the, the reason and what we used to call endogenous money, what I'd like us to call bombed from now on, why that matters and why neoclassicals are wrong to ignore it. And of course, when they ignore it, if you're ignoring credit, you're ignoring a, not, to the, not the biggest component of demand, but by far the most volatile. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. But I want to now talk about how do you do macroeconomics? Because one reason neoclassicals disparage what post Keynesians do is we don't have good micro foundations. Now, I've seen a very good reply recently saying good micro foundations. If you, look in, if you even drill down inside the neoclassical thing and bring in some realism about firms, their good micro foundations haven't got good micro foundations anyway. And there's an enormous critique of the whole micro foundations debate done um, by, by neoclassicals by accident. It's what you call an own goal in football. Okay? You had originally, it was a guy called Gorman in 1953 proved the only way you could aggregate was if all consumers had parallel Engels curves, if you know what that, that means, in terms of no change in, their, in, their, in, in their, the ratio of their expenditure as the income rose. So if, they, if you're earning $100 a, 100 euro a, a, a week and you're buying one pizza, when you earn a million euros a week, you're buying 10,000 pizzas. Okay? And the same thing applies to toilet rolls and everything else. Okay, nonsense. And that also required that commodities are identical as well as consumers. Now in that world, what that is, is it's a world with one consumer and one product. So how can you have relative prices? It's, it undermines the entire neoclassical paradigm, but nonetheless that's what they do. And this is the, this is the argument from Schaefer and Sonnenschein saying the utility hypothesis tells us nothing about market demand unless you add additional requirements. And what fundamentally this means is their theory leaves out the distribution of income. The distribution of income is the explanation for the downward sloping market demand curve if one exists. Okay? Because they can't explain why it slopes down. It's what they leave out that explains why the demand for things falls as their price rises. The poor can't afford to buy them, fundamentally. So this is nonsense to have to work in this way in the first place. And again, if you learn complex systems work, there's a highly recommended paper worth reading called More is Different by a genuine Nobel Prize winner in physics called, uh, called uh, Anderson and Philip Anderson. And he said, the behavior of large and complex aggregates cannot be understood by extrapolation, which is exactly what neoclassicals are doing, extrapolating from one to the, to the, to the collective. So they said, that doesn't even work with water. Okay? Molecules of water are identical. Okay? Is there an ice molecule? Is there a steam molecule? Okay? No. There are interactions between identical particles which generate those conditions under certain levels of pressure and temperature. But there's no such thing. You can't derive ice from a molecule of H2O. Okay? Or any, any other of the forms in which we experience water. So the behaviour of the macroeconomy is determined by its structure. And this is what I see... Hey, good to see you, mate. Um, what, this is what I see as the essential insight of people like Minsky and Schumpeter. We really can't understand a complex system completely, but we can get the basic insights from it. And some of these basic insights we already know about, uh, about 
for the favour of firms. But we, if you look at the economy in an incredibly simple way, you can see what Minsky and Schumpeter and Co saw in about, about it by working from the macroeconomic definitions themselves. So if we define the employment rate as the number of people with a job divided by population, there is no way to argue with that definition. Unlike the neoclassical micro foundations, you can't reject that. It's a definition. Okay? The wages share of GDP, total bill of wages divided by GDP, and the ratio of private debt to GDP, which I've now up by arguing that credit matters, that is an essential component of macroeconomics. If you differentiate those with respect to time, you get three verbal statements of those definitions. And that's the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of the growth in labour productivity and population. The wages share of output will rise if wage demands exceed the growth in labour productivity. And private debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. They're actually simply very, very simple redefinitions of definitions, but just putting them in dynamic form. And you can generalise that to include prices as well, which I've done, uh, which I might set as an exercise. There's the employment rate, economic growth, growth and labour productivity. The hat, by the way, means the percentage rate of change. So 1 over lambda d, lambda d, t equals, etc. on the right-hand side. Growth of population. Wage a share of output, there's wage demands, whatever they might be caused by. I don't even need a Phillips curve argument. I haven't yet brought a Phillips curve argument in there. And the private debt ratio will rise if debt growth exceeds the rate of growth of the economy. So they're all actually true statements. So if you take those true statements, and you add the simplest possible relationships between variables, make output a linear function of capital. Of course, I've got to modify that in a lot of what I've said earlier. I'd make it a linear function of the amount of energy converted into work by capital. Investment is a linear function of the rate of profit minus depreciation. Employment a linear function of output. And wage change a linear function of the employment rate. Even though Phillips said it was non-linear, we can start with a linear because the linear is the approximation of any non-linear function uh, for the first approximation. And change in debt equals investments minus profits. So I've not even got Ponzi investing in here. I've got genuine investing that builds factories. Okay. So put that together. So there's the linear... Uh, capital output ratio and, and linear depreciation investment as well. There's a wage change function, which is a simple linear function. A linear function for the rate of investment as a function of the rate of profit. And debt financing investment, which empirically has been found by even people like Famer and French. So it's an empirical relationship. This, generally speaking, investment increases debt and profit reduces debt. And then constant rate of growth in labour productivity and in population. And what I get is that system. So the, the elements in red are either system states or uh, functions that involve system states. So the IGG there is gross investment, which is defined down here, which is based on the rate of profit. The wage chain is based on the level of employment. The rate of profit includes profit share, based on profit share. Put that together, and it's a bit like the Lorenz model, the three equation model that Lorenz builds. And mathematically, it has one stable negative real eigenvalue, which means that's bringing it towards stability, but two complex eigenvalues, which are pushing it away. And they turn positive and become dominant over the negative as the rate, as the, the, um, rate of uh, the slope of the investment function changes. So let's demonstrate that in Minsky. This is using Minsky simply to do differential equations. I'll just, uh, if I make that a bit larger, let's just zoom in and show that properly. So that's basically a flow chart defining the employment rate using that, exactly that uh, argument I've shown you earlier. If you go to the equations tab, uh, then you can see the same equations I've mentioned to you over here. So Minsky generates those equations as you do the, the wiring here. If I go back to the full scale of this and I simulate it with a, a low level of uh, desire to invest by capitalists, which of course technically speaking you don't want, you'd want them to be, you want to have good animal spirits. What you get is a system that, sta that cycles towards an equilibrium. You, 
can see it's converging. Wages share is falling. There are income distribution dynamics going on here as well, by the way, and you'll see them more clearly in the next model. But the rising level of debt, even though the money's being borrowed by the firms to do investment, it's being paid for by the workers and a lower share of GDP. So rising level of debt means falling worker share of income. And that's a given in this model. Again, it's not a, that's not an assumption I imposed on the model. This is an emergent property. So emergent properties don't just happen with multi-agent models. They happen with system dynamics models as well. Okay? And this is a surprise to me. I didn't know this. I didn't expect to happen when I first built this model back in 1992. Though I used nonlinear functions back then. Okay, let's now just make that rate of invest the rate of uh, desire to invest by capitalists more extreme, which again is what you want. This is the sort of you know strong animal spirits types. And what you see, it looks like it's doing the same thing. The cycles are converging even faster than they appear to be, only they don't continue converging. They diverge. You go from diminishing cycles to rising cycles. Now, if you were a neoclassical, you would call this a great moderation, which is what they did. Okay? This they called the Great Recession, thinking they were two independent events, but they emerge out of the one. And this is something which Minsky himself did not see in his own predictions. He did talk about stability being destabilizing. I've got that on my T-shirt. I'll be wearing when I'm playing tennis with Mark later. Okay. Um, but what he talked about was a rising level of debt leading to a breakdown. Okay? He didn't say there'd be a period of... He, he said if you have stability, over time that will lead to breakdown. What he didn't see was the apparent stability of employment and wage share of GDP would, would improve, would get more stability, followed by a breakdown later. This again is that emergent property. So notice also the worker share of GDP is falling more severely. So when you have a rising level of inequality, because workers are getting less and bankers are getting more, capitalists come out even, by the way. When you do the mathematics of this, capitalist income distribution fluctuates around an equilibrium until it breaks down. Okay? They're the last ones to know capitalism is failing, as you can tell from Davos. Um, and what you get is it's driven by a rising level of debt. So whereas beforehand the previous simulation had a maximum of about 0.4 or 0.6 as the debt ratio, this has hit 3. This will ultimately break down. And I can go to more elaborate models than that as well. This is the same model, including prices, with nonlinear functions. And I'll just uh, uh, simulate that. And what you get, a range of fluctuations, apparent stability, but then ultimately a breakdown. As I said, the last ones to know capitalism is collapsing are the capitalists. That's the profit share of output. Okay. Everything is absolutely hunky-dory until it all falls apart. So what you get is something which is much closer to the actual behaviour of the economy than anything neoclassicals have ever produced. But it's incredibly simple. The complex systems approach is far stronger than the neo what the neoclassicals have done. And their entire endeavour has been keeping out complex systems thinking. Nordhaus in particular played a huge role there because he was the one who destroyed the reputation of the limits to growth study when it first came out, which was effectively the first complex systems model applied to both economics and the ecology. So you get a cyclically raising debt ratio, cycles follow, diminishing followed by rising cycles, which is the phenomenon first spotted by um, hydrologists, called, uh, mathem mathematical hydrology theorists Pomo and Manaville, what they call the intermittent route to chaos as part of the Lorenz equations. And you get rising inequality, falling worker share, rising work, rising bankers share. So you get those stylized problems, the stylized thing we've seen in the real world come out of this incredibly simple model derived strictly from definitions. So that's, that's the approach I would recommend for post-Keynesian economics to adopt, to go from those definitions, of course including the debt level, of course including government, which I haven't done in these models so far, which add ex extra levels of complexity in the behaviour. But what you get out of it, you'll see turning up in the real data. That's the rising level of private debt to GDP in America. That's the diminishing cycles in inflation and unemployment that they thought were heralding the great, you know, the, the end of the business cycle. And that's the breakdown. So it all turns up in the data itself. Now to show some of those statistics, I'll go across to, to MathCAD. And this is looking just at the relationship of 
the level of private debt and credit. Notice for the whole of the post-war period, debt's rising and credit is positive, even during the 1990s recession. Only in the 2006, 2008 crash did credit go negative for America. When you look at credit, how does it relate to unemployment? Again, according to neoclassicals, there should be no relationship. To quote Bernanke, he actually said, Ab abs the, uh, uh, absent Im Im implausible differences in propensity to consume, there should be no significant macroeconomic impact. Well, bullshit, again. The correlation coefficient there between 1992 uh, and today is minus 0.85. Rising credit means falling unemployment and vice versa. Of course, on top of that, there's all the impact of government spending behaviour and so on. But fundamentally, credit drives the dynamics of the macro economy. And when you look at the house price level, the same thing occurs. When you differentiate that relationship between credit and house prices, my definition of the... And you can, you can use the supply and demand argument here. Turn this against the neoclassicals. Okay? The supply of housing. It's a fixed proportion, no, a variable proportion of the current housing stock plus new houses being created. The demand is fundamentally mortgages, new mortgages, which is change in mortgage debt. Divide change in mortgage debt by the price level, gives you one relationship. Differentiate that, you've got a relationship between ex change in the change of mortgage debt or change in mortgage credit and change in house prices. And the correlation there is 0 0.66 between 1992 and today for America. And I can give you similar data for France and any other country you care to request. But that is the empirical basis on which we can show the importance of the post-Keynesian work on the endogeneity of money and Minsky's work on the financial instability hypothesis. I'll leave it there. Um, so yeah, this will only go for like 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, and we gonna go a little bit um, into Minsky's theoretical framework, uh, the aftermath of the crisis and um, policies that could be uh, deriving from that. Um, and in the end, Jan will talk a bit about modeling limitations and then we will open up the floor for further questions. Um, yeah, so there's a good reason why uh, the model you used uh, has the name Minsky. Um, he made in the uh, he made the uh, endogeneity of uh, instability into capitalism famous in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and here we want to start with a quote: "Can it a Great Depression happen again? And if it can happen, why didn't it occur in the years since the World War II?" Um, these are uh, questions uh, that naturally follow from both uh, his historical record and the comparison uh, comparative success of the past 35 years. Um, yeah, well, uh, we want to find out why um, there's an endogeneity of um, speculation in uh, Minsky's theoretical framework, and we will do so by introducing the financial instability hypothesis of um, Hyman P. Minsky, um, which basically distinguish, uh, distinguishes the mode of finance into three uh, separate um, mm, financial um, measures, uh, which starts by hedge finance, w uh, hedge finance, which takes place uh, when the cash flow from operations uh, is expected to be large enough um, to meet the payment commitments on debts. So you have a rather conservative approach there. But if you ha is, as you have the stability, um, companies tend to um, invest into speculative finance. Um, where you need a, need a rise in your cash flows to uh, um, be able to pay back uh, your debt obligations and um, through the indigeneity of money or the bombs um, we, um, we have a rise in, um, in risk in the, uh, in the um, economy and through uh, more and more speculative finance we at some point uh, come to Ponzi finance where you need to take on credit um, to ba pay back your credit uh, obligations that you already have, and through the uh, because of this uh, vicious cycle that you uh, at, that everybody's basically interconnected in the uh, in the uh, economy, risk is rising and the Minsky moment um, develops where everything um, where basically because 
the confidence level of the economy is uh, based upon um, the assumption that everything is stable, but if somebody then decides that it gets too risky, you have the vicious cycle that debt obligations in the intertwined uh, economy can't be, uh, can't be met. Um, and the second framework we want to introduce, a more historical approach of uh, Minsky, is the theory of money manager capitalism, where we uh, have basically four uh, periods of capitalism that uh, Randall Ray and Minsky um, de uh, defined, uh, which started with commercial capitalism in the uh, late 19th uh, late 19th uh, century, where you basically only had uh, risk-averse commercial loans from uh, which were took on by private owners. Um, but then, during the Great Depression, we had the rise of investment banks, um, and investments were became speculative uh, and uh, investment banks were the source of, became the source of finance leading through the uh, Great Depression and in the time of managerial capitalism you had uh, a rise in the wage share through the, through the New Deal. Um, also, um, yeah, I unfortunately I don't have much time and um, then uh, money manager capitalism basically resembles the face of the um, uh, financial crisis in 2008, but a little bit l more later to that, because um, before that, I think the biggest topic of uh, Steve Keen's work is on private debt, and uh, here we can see the private debt level just bec uh, before the Great Depression in the, in the in late 1920s, early 30s, um, and also in the uh, like not aftermath uh, before the uh, financial crisis in 2008. And I think, especially if you compare the private debt level um, with government debt, uh, which is like in the media or in the more publicized pro uh, problem, uh, the government debt, which it shouldn't be, you see uh, that the level of private debt is far exceeding the level of uh, government debt. Yeah, um, and a few uh, a few yeah, uh, staples of the. Um, of the money manager capitalism is basically what we talk about a lot here. A lot here in the program is uh, the course of financialization leading to a debt-led growth, a decline in pro a progressive taxation, a rise in the um, profitability, uh, and like also the uh, the assumption that profit profitability is a is a measure of soundness, um, and um, yeah, it happened basically through. Um, like the deregulation of commercial banks and uh, a shift to shareholder value orientation and um, ever upcoming uh, new financial innovations like CODs or securitization in uh, in general. Um, but yeah, Andres will now talk a little bit more about the aftermath. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the aftermath of crisis. So. If we, if we take into consideration the share of private debt in the uh, global, fi uh, global financial crisis, what we can conclude, at least conclude, is that market-driven me mechanism alone uh, are, not are unlikely to reduce the private debt to GDP ratio. Um, so as a response to the, the crisis, uh, parallel currencies were came into light, so I will not go through all of them, but probably uh, we know cryptocurrencies and uh, lots of people were hopeful about it, but it could not scale up to the level that they make up for the failure of the private banks based monetary system. So also I will go, now I will go through the uh, policy suggestions by professor and uh, try to do an overview on it. So uh, firstly, um, modern debt jubilee, so what it means, uh, going through it very quickly, so it is a mold between, uh, it's a mold between helicopter money and, uh, uh, helicopter money and I forgot it. <laughs> it was a mold between helicopter money and the other one was uh, uh, injection of, uh, of pro, sorry? 
Yep, I, I think helicopter money and uh, the other one. Any, anyways. That we have the obligation to, um, while we receive the uh, helicopter money, uh, that we have the obligation to pay off our debts if existing first, and that's not um, like exactly the concept of hel helicopter money because uh, like that's a twist in the policy, right? Yeah, and a range of other things as well, but fundamentally. Yeah. Thank you once again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, what it does is it just resets the clock uh, to another speculative bubble. Um, so another policy suggestion done by uh, Professor Keaton was is banking system reform. So uh, we can propose entrepreneurial equity loan. So the idea here is that we are trying to reduce the private debt in order to sustain the financial stability, right? So uh, what equi equity loan does is that the banks would give out loan to the entrepreneurs according to the, according as an equity loan, not as a credit. <coughs> and the other one is state capacity to create money as macroeconomic management tool. However, uh, we can get to a point of financial stability, but still it's a vibrant uh, capitalist economy. So we can play with the rhetoric, capitalism, uh, new capitalism, capitalist, capitalism 2.0, but the, uh, we have to take into account um, that the inherent cap, uh, nature of capitalism is boom and bust. So what we can see from, uh, from the global financial crisis, um, a private debt trend in USA is that after the crisis we can see a sh uh, trivial fall in the um, debt ratio in the private debt ratio in the GDP, which was 30 percent lower at the time of the global financial crisis. So why I we want to show this is that even after the global financial crisis, if we stick with the spare of private debt as one of the inducing factor of financial crisis, we see that it has not, the policy has not been set in order to lower down these private debts. So if we take into, so since, uh, if we take history into account, and I got this also from professor's book, um, is that the time when it, the debt ratio actually went down was during the time of war. Uh, for example, in UK, government debt rose by 44%, like during the war time, from two, two 20% to 340% of GDP. And the private debt, it uh, lowered to by 30%, <coughs> um, because it was being complemented by the, by the uh, government debt. So what I want to say is that also in your conclusion that you suggest that no, we cannot find, uh, actually um, avoid financial crisis because there are countries with, who are zombified and uh, zombie to be, I think. Mm. Um, so what uh, we think is that what could be a crisis, a global crisis that's not war or something else, which could be an interesting discussion as, uh, among us, and what could be another global crisis that actually induces this uh, private debt to go down? And what could be an institutional arrangement taking into consideration both the global south and global north? So much on policies. Okay. I'm running out of, of time, so I will go really quickly with the two additional comments. Uh, the first one is uh, you propose uh, the solutions that are proposed in the book are focused on uh, fostering demand um, and maybe uh, the government taking care of debt instead of private debt so we avoid the crisis when the, the ever-rising private debt to GDP finally stops. Uh, my question is uh, about um, external constraints and limits to demand on, uh, because this can help on countries as Japan as you present in, in chapter 3 uh, because they have a huge uh, trade sur surplus, but what does it happen in 
um, developing countries that have the ex uh, external constraint uh, as um, we can uh, uh, we know for since Tirwall's uh, equation that we need to uh, develop our exports to get enough um, currency to sustain growth. So what would be the case in this uh, in these countries uh, that are not able to allocate uh, money wi within their or currency so they cannot uh, sustain all their debts on uh, the central bank uh, emitting money. So uh, what would you suggest in those cases uh, to deal with uh, replacing private debt by the government, uh, and how to finance innovation uh, by the private sector in this context, that would be also interesting. Uh, and finally, uh, I want to add a comment on uh, modeling limitations. Uh, since you presented that mainstream fails in identification crisis, and also that uh, because uh, and a spurious correlation between government surplus in good times and government deficits, we have this bad idea about government deficits. Uh, so that's misreading patterns, uh, but I think that we are also talking about um, prediction of crisis and prediction of something that maybe we cannot predict. So which are the limits of modeling uh, since we are not able to do experimental um, research? So I think that we as economists, we should uh, recognize that we are using uh, limited techniques. And what your, are your comments about that as well? Because some of your predictions are also based on modeling. Uh, and that would be all, since I'm also running out of time. Uh, here is there you have a summary of the questions that we presented along our presentation with an additional one that it would be the hot topic of Brexit. And so why are you so heavily in favor of the Brexit? And what would the uh, EU EU uh, have to do um, to properly reform itself? And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for obviously. Actually, I will use my computer a bit here, so I'll just want to show a couple of things. So I'll grab Mark. I've got to steal your uh, your precious again. Practice. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> If we did, but did, both didn't have good hand-eye coordination, <laughs> there'd be trouble. Sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's the other way, I think. Is that it's the other no, the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Woo. That's why that wakes up. All right. First thing I want to say is uh, let's get our terms right. Uh, because you did use the word credit when you showed that, that, that sort of stylized curve you had there. You had credit showing up. And I want to show you somebody else who made exactly the same mistake. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces of paper. Uh, to, to, you know the guys who created what they call real business cycle theory. Well, it explained everything in terms of changes in preferences, shifting in utility functions, and shocks to technology change, and that's it. That's the entire explanation for everything on the planet. Well, of course, they didn't see the financial crisis coming. They were cheerleaders for the great moderation, that lot. Um, and this is Ohanian, who's one of the research uh, affiliates of uh, Prescott, who had developed that nonsense in the first place. And in this paper in 2010, he's talking about the crisis from a neoclassical perspective. And one thing he did, he ruled out that the financial crisis was caused by the financial sector. Okay. How did he rule that out? This chart. Notice there's the ratio of bank credit to GDP from 78 to 2010. And you'll notice it's very similar to the chart that I showed you guys a moment ago, this one. So it's not quite the same data, but the same type of data. And he said, well, obviously, yes, credit was high before the crisis began, but it's pretty much the same level after, so credit couldn't have caused it. That is brain dead crap. Okay, I'm getting even worse after I cease being an academic and with my language being more Australian. Um, look at the ratios over here. Two. Okay. He thinks credit means change in debt. And it does. You should say debt, which is denominated in dollars or euros or the actual currency, and credit is the change in that over time. 
That's the correct definition. Statisticians are using the sloppy language economists have developed because the buggers don't understand money in the first place. It's not credit, it's debt. Okay? Now, if it was credit, then he would be saying the annual change in the level of in the level of change in debt would be twice GDP. Okay? Now it would mean in a couple of a couple of in a decade or so debt would be twenty thousand times GDP. It's not credit, it's debt. And when you differentiate that, you get the second one I show down here. Okay? That's why they're so blind to it. So we, we, need this, we can't blame the statisticians for using the wrong word to label it because economists do the same thing. We should leave the bad mistakes to the neoclassicals and define properly. It's debt, not credit, in that particular curve you had beforehand. Credit's the dif differential of debt. Uh, one, one observation there. Um, yeah, the Jubilee um, is a... Uh, uh, the Jubilee idea, I haven't had, a, I haven't had time to work on it, um, which is why I didn't see a lot of it in that, in that book. Uh, I want to write something on about it now, particularly given the gilet jaune factor here in, in, the, in France, which I think is a, a marvellous, and as, as, as Mark would agree with me after we had a bit of a conversation about this in, in the UK about a month or so ago, only the French could bring up something like that. It's, it's classically the, the element of French society that, that Marx captured so well when he said he wanted to combine German philosophy with English political economy and French politics. Okay. You do politics much better than anywhere else in the world. Um, so I want to do more on the debt jubilee, but part of the idea is to stop this accumulation factor. Okay, we, we, we're accumulating debt when we have a credit-driven system, and that leads to the crisis we're having now. Now, we, we, there's no possibility on this planet of reforming it so that we don't have the problem again. We have, that's why a jubilee is needed as a sort of band-aid to that system. But imagine what hopefully will happen in Mars in the next few decades if an outpost is established there. It will need a monetary system at some point. And you, there's no billionaires, well there's only one billionaire on Mars and he intends dying there. He said hopefully not an impact. Uh, but he intends dying there but it's, he, he hasn't, you haven't got the, we haven't got the Rupert Murdochs on Mars. Okay? Okay. We could start a monetary system on that planet when a civilization is built there, that used Gazelle's, Gazelle's idea of money, where money depreciates over time unless it's spent. And I think that the whole problem, again, the accumulation of wealth, and the fact that the money system always accumulates, one potential remedy is the one Gazelle put forward so long ago, that unless you spend it, it depreciates. Okay? And that addresses two factors, the tendency to hoard, which has got far worse, uh, as the levels of private debt has risen, and the power that goes with having that money, which is manifest in having debt other people owe to you. Okay? So I would like to see the Gazellian idea, I think we should actually re revive from a post-Keynesian point of view. In terms of actual how do we reduce debt, there's a very good book coming out later this year by a good friend of mine who's not an economist, Richard Vague. I don't know if you've heard the name before. Richard is a billionaire through creating two credit companies and one energy company. And in the process of his, in his second credit company, he became worried about what he was seeing in terms of mortgage debt because he thought, with this much mortgage debt, how can my customers repay their credit card debt? And he would go challenging economists, and they'd all say, oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, their assets have risen in value, but so have their liabilities, and rejecting his arguments. He also runs a website called Delancey Place, which is a book reading Side. He regularly reads books and other people do in the group as well and publish extracts from them. So he's always scouring through bookshops. And he said he saw, debunk having had this experience dealing with economists, he went through, went through some bookshop in Philadelphia, I think, in the, the library there, and saw a copy of Debunking Economics. Instantly attracted his attention after all these discussions he had with economists about whether to worry about the crisis or not. He said he flicked it open and he saw his graph staring back at him. Okay. So that's how we became colleagues. But he's commissioned a study into the last one and a half centuries of financial crises around the world. There have been roughly 150 in those 150 years. He said every last one of them was a debt crisis caused by private debt. Okay. No economy bar one or two grew their way out of debt. Okay. The whole idea you can grow your way out of this is it doesn't, doesn't apply. The only ones that, which could did that had a huge export surplus. Countries like Saudi Arabia when the oil price rose dramatically. They said in every last case, the only way out of the crisis was the debt was written off. Okay. 
Now, the, the real worry that I have is we'll write this debt off the same way we did during the Second World War, okay? In an existential crisis when nobody worries about the level of government spending, and that will then drive the debt down. That existential crisis, this time being climate change, of course. So that's my, my main worry that we'll do it that way rather than practically. But I do recommend looking at Richard's book when it comes out. Uh, the balance of payments constraint, this is one area where I diverge quite <coughs> emphatically from modern monetary theory. I think modern monetary theory is completely correct in its own analysis of the monetary system, the role of government money and so on. But this stuff about exports being a cost, imports being a benefit, is a false application of neoclassical concepts of, of um, uh, opportunity costs where they don't apply. Okay? This to me, uh, if I have any explanation for why this has come about, I think it's Warren Mosler's uh, little, uh, Warren was the original source of the modern monetary theory argument that governments don't tax to spend, they spend to, and tax to withdraw the money from circulation. Uh, that's quite legitimate, that's quite sensible. But he also came up with this exports are a cost and imports are a benefit and I don't, I think the modern monetary theory leading apparatchiks aren't willing to step on Warren's toes and say look Warren that only applies in full employment, we haven't got full employment, therefore exports are not necessarily a cost. Okay. Uh, and I think that's quite ignorant, frankly. Um, and that's why I think bringing up Thurwell's 1979 paper is an excellent uh, observation. That is a constraint. If you were running, if you were trying to develop an economy where you don't have the local capacity to build the, the uh, machinery you need, then you have to import that machinery, which means you, you can't pay for it in your own currency. It's a major constraint in your economy. And for my way of thinking, when you apply an MMT approach to domestic finances as you should, the main constraint you face is the external constraint. Okay, so I think it's quite valid, and I'd be delighted to see any of you challenge that particular dogma of MMT, because it believes and needs to be challenged, in my opinion. Um, then the, the, the also a very good point about spurious correlation. Government deficits during bad times, surpluses being during good. That is a very potent political force that people who are against the sort of MMT reforms that I completely support are using. Look, deficits occur during crises. Of course they do. Okay? Uh, and of course, governments trying to run surpluses during good times actually partly triggers the private sector borrowing money, which you can all explain using some of the parts of Minsky I haven't actually demonstrated today, the double entry bookkeeping godly tables that I use there. So I think that's a two very, very good points. And on, on Brexit, I didn't vote for Brexit because I thought it was good for the UK. I voted for Brexit because I thought getting rid of the European Union is a good idea for Europe. I think the European, the European Union has been a, a totally neoliberal, actually auto-liberal stroke neoliberal enterprise, which has made wage suppression uh, and suppression of workers' rights a core concept of it. It's anti-democratic if you look at the way the European Union is set up. The bureaucrats draft the laws. Where on else on the planet do the bureaucrats draft the laws apart from China? Okay, and frankly, China is more responsive to its people than the European Union is, because China is a de one way that one place that show the French get beaten is by Chinese, and when it comes to demonstrations. Okay, uh, there were plenty of, of, of poli poli uh, uh, members of the Communist Party who were in fear of their lives uh, when the t when the crisis hit in 2008, because something like 45 million unemployed workers were forced to migrate back to their rural properties, uh, re where they actually were registered to get unemployment benefits. And that meant to a huge level of, of desire to turn the economy around by the Chinese Communist Party uh, and stimulate the economy. Whereas in Europe, you got Greece and you got Spain and you got Portugal and the sort of depressed state of Italy and France as well. I thought, but the, I, it, again, uh, it would have been better if the French had done it because the English are hopeless at politics. May has completely stuffed up the negotiations. And as Yanis Varoufakis said back in 2016, and he's iterate, reiterated a few times recently, um, they should just have said, we want a Norway deal and we want to give it it's given seven years before it gets reconsidered. He said that would have worked. Don't try to negotiate with these bastards. They'll run you around rings in Brussels. Uh, they don't want to, they want to expand the European Union. They don't want to contract. They'll run you around in rings. You'll end up nowhere after two years. That's exactly where they've ended up. So if Brexit occurred again, I'd stay in bed. I wouldn't bother getting out and voting, okay, because the British handled it so badly. But that's why I voted for Brexit. Okay. Now we Thank you very much. Uh, now we will open the floor uh, and rounds of.
three questions. Are you okay with that? Like yeah, three yeah. questions and then you answer? Uh, yeah, it's often better. I think it's better, better answering questions one after the other. Like a question, answer, question, answer, because okay. it's, it's more, more all stylized if you do it three at a time. Okay. We will start with Francesca and then I will write it down. British <laughs> colleague. Huh? I gathered. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you, Steve, for your presentation. And uh, my name is Francesca. I'm from Option B, which is macroeconomics and financial policies. Speak up because it's voice here. It's Sorry. actually not being amplified. So it's not being, put, okay. Put so, okay, I'll talk. Okay. Away, just talk louder, um, yeah. So, yes, and as people were saying, I, I am from the UK. And I wanted to ask you, as an economist um, who's been based in the UK for a long time, um, what you think of the Bank of England predictions for uh, if the scenario of a no-deal Brexit, which day by day seems to be coming more mm. and more likely. I mean, they're predicting a, a decrease in GDP by 8%, uh, unemployment by almost 8% as well. I mean, perhaps the magnitudes is not quite exact, but given the fact that uh, private household debt levels in the UK are the highest that they've ever been on record, um, especially been exacerbated by the Brexit vote in 2016, with um, higher inflation, surely that, um, given we are looking at the debt levels, this is kind of the we're looking at the UK as if it's a patient, and we can see this is a sign it's not well. You know, surely that if the UK does leave the EU with no deal, that this will be like the kind of the heart attack moment, and it will trigger another crisis in the UK. I'd like to ask you that, uh, and also just briefly to go back on. Um, describing the EU as a, a neoliberal institution. I think given the reality of British politics right now, the fact that it's the Conservative Party who are by far the most neoliberal party that is in power, um, leaving the EU is actually far more damaging because the EU has been protecting British workers from far more neoliberal policies that the Tory party will now be able to enforce once we leave the EU. Thanks. I think the Tories have got um, six months to one and a half years before they get wiped out by, by Corbyn. The only thing making that less likely is Corbyn's own Labour Party trying to shoot him in the back. Because they're, if you, Maggie Thatcher said her greatest creation wasn't the Conservative Party, it was the Labour Party. Okay? She actually, one of her advisors said he wouldn't be happy when there was a Conservative Party in government. He'd be happy when there were two Conservative parties vying for, 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 uh, for leadership. If you look at the Labour Party before Corbyn, read the 2015 manifesto, they literally say four times in one paragraph that everything they do will be about reducing the government deficit. They completely bought into the Tories' picture about the whole thing. Um, so, and this damage, the UK shot itself on the foot over austerity for the last pretty much a decade, and there's been nothing like, there was nothing like the debate about austerity that there's been about Brexit. So, uh, and Brexit wouldn't have occurred without the austerity that the Labour Party under uh, Miliband and friends was a, was, a, was a supporter of all that way through. So I think in some ways, and also the European Union let the, let the Brits ignore their responsibilities domestically as well. They could leave worker rights discussions to the European Union. They could leave funding research to the European Union. Uh, they, there was lots and lots of ways to let the Brits escape from their own political uh, responsibilities at the time. In terms of the damage it'll do, yes, uh, it could do a substantial amount of damage, but nothing like what's being spoken about because a large part of what's going to happen will also be a fall in the a totally overvalued level of the pound. Now, there's going to be huge practical issues in terms of getting all that, uh, uh, all the uh, goods shipped through Calais. Okay, I've been both ways in that tunnel. I've got an idea of what's being spoken about. Um, so I see those practical issues. But again, if you look at what the Euro European Union negotiated with Singapore, the deal is just negotiated with the Singapore is identical to why they say they can't negotiate with the, with, with the UK. Okay? There's a free trade deal now between the European Union and Singapore. They've reduced the level of, of documentation necessary. One, they're effectively accepting one country's verifications of its customs rights as, as, as valid as entry into the other. The European Union has done everything they can to shoot the Brits in the foot, and the Brits have helped by shooting themselves in the other foot. So I, th I think in this case, uh, I would just say, what, what is the value of the European Union? It is, a, is a, it is a negative institution for workers' rights. It's a negative institution for government spending. Uh, it's something you can't politically control. 
You're seeing it yourself in France right now, with Macron being told he's allowed a temporary increase in the deficit, but they've got to go back and reform it so it's likely afterwards. You've got an unelectable, unremovable political cabal controlling the Europe, Europe's fate and pushing it into a state of permanent depression. I want to get rid of it. Uh, hello, Mr. Green. Uh, I'm Arnaud. I'm from Quebec, and I'm in Ambition uh, B, which is financial policies. Uh, the previous question was very interesting, so I feel a, a little bit bad about changing topic. Uh, but uh, talking about the, the solutions, first we talked about debt jubilee. I presume it's a temporary solution because we don't want this. We don't want to have to wipe out debt many times. But in the meantime, I think about the, the difference with what we do right now, which is public bailout. And whereas right now the public pays the consequences of credit boom, uh, of debt boom, right now the the people who go into debt would have to deal with the consequences instead of just average people, if I understood correctly. So in that sense, the Jubilee would be better than public bailout. Then the other, the other solution that was uh, brought up by the presenters was entrepreneurial equity loan. I would like to know more about that. And the final one was uh, state-created money. So I was wondering, how does this compare, state-created money, how does this compare to the current system uh, of the interest rate uh, between banks? and what Positive Money UK suggests. And uh, finally, as a comment, uh, YouTube has a lot of interesting stuff from uh, Steve Keen's video to Davos videos. So I was wondering if you had um, comments to do or uh, about uh, what's uh, happening right now in Davos or if you could direct us toward uh, an interesting video that they have online since yeah. they have okay. interesting okay. people talking. Yeah. I think we have a lot of people who want to say something. So okay. Oh, they'll take those. That's the set of questions I can answer. Yes, so let's get a few more. Okay. Uh, maybe limit your uh, comments to like one or two questions. Yeah. Like that was four four questions four questions in one there. Yeah. No, to solutions and Davos comment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any okay. others? Uh, there are plenty, but if you want to do one on one, then. Okay. I'll just quickly. Debt Jubilee, we need a temporary one to reduce debt levels by about two thirds. Okay. The level of debt, anything below 50%. It seems quite sustainable. It's not that's that's the level America had during its golden age, and we've currently got a debt level three and four times that around the world. Country America, France's level is over two hundred percent of GDP right now. For example, I'll I'll show that that's the UK's debt data by the way, which I didn't talk about enough during the previous answer. Notice during uh, and right out until nineteen eighty two, the debt level is below seventy percent of GDP, and for the whole whole century before Maggie Thatcher got in control. Debt never exceeded 75% of GDP. It then quadru virtually quadrupled for a while from 55% when she came to power up to 200% of GDP. Okay, so we're literally, that's how much of a financial bubble we've allowed to be created. We've got to get rid of that and that's about a three or one third, or two thirds or three quarters reduction. But I would bring in Jubilees as a regular part of government policy. You just don't want that debt to accumulate and government money creation using debt to create to either cancel or offset private debt is quite feasible on a regular basis. So I would see it as being an alternative to targeting unemployment and, and direct spending, targeting level of private debt. So it could be built in as a, as a permanent feature of a monetary system once we understand how it operates. And the thing is that we have policies based on not understanding how money operates right now. So once you have a fully conscious knowledge of the creation of money and the creation of debt and government spending as well, plus the foreign sector, then you can do this on a regular basis. It goes with all the gazillion money. Entrepreneurial equity loans, one of, one of the problems about modern with positive money approach, uh, and I'm on the positive board, money advisory board, and I'm very, very ha like the people and like the work they're doing uh, overall, they want 100% government created money. I, I, the problem I can see with that is that bureaucrats are trained to try to avoid making mistakes. Now, therefore, they're the worst people possible to evaluate whether you should give money to an entrepreneur or not. Whereas the private sector has got into Ponzi schemes. Now, and, th and the reason they won't lend to entrepreneurs is if you have five entrepreneurs, four of them are going to go bust. Okay? So if you lent to them and uh, had a debt obligation, you'd lose your money on four out of five and make interest on number five. Therefore, you don't lend to any of them. But if, if banks could take equity positions, 
then they could lose money on four and make a, make a bomb out of the fifth. So entrepreneurial equity loans would be lending to entrepreneurs but having an equity stake in that loan, creating money in the same way that debt money creates money now, uh, so they could make money out of that. I don't believe banks would be profitable enough to function if all they could work on was arbitrage. If you think about the positive money idea, it's banks have a reserve account at the Reserve Bank from which they can lend, and they then make money on the arbitrage, the difference between the deposit rates and the loan rates. Now that is, the, the main way banks make money now is out of the, 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 the quantity side. They create the money, and they charge interest on that created money. If we remove that, I think they'll be unprofitable institutions, even if they were reduced to the scale they should be, which is about one quarter what they are right now. So the entrepreneurial equity loans are a way they could create money um, and make money out of the creation process as well. Um, but I'd also like to potentially harness crowdfunding. I'm a, I've actually, you know, I'm supported by crowdfunding now. I've also supported a large number of crowdfunding uh, crowdfunded ventures myself. And I think that the intelligence of crowds is one, one way to do that. We could give people a certain amount of money every year, which they could only use on crowdfunding. If they took an equity position and that made money, I'm at it great. If they didn't and lost money, who cares? What they're doing is sponsoring innovation. And that's the, the, the best argument capitalism has going for that's a genuine argument rather than the crap about it being a system that hits equilibrium, which is what neoclassicals are obsessed on. The strong strength it has is sponsoring innovation, whereas our financial sector doesn't do that. But that's what it should do. So we need to redesign it in such a way that it sponsors innovation. And that's where you, you can't rely upon bureaucrats to do that because they're trained not to make mistakes. Um, yeah, and state created money, I mean again, government deficits financed by the central bank uh, create the money. When you look at governments financing by selling bonds to the financial sector, they're releasing money which has been left in the financial sector which would otherwise accumulate there and lead to either you know, atrophy of the real economy or, or speculation. So I see the government bonds as releasing pre-existing money, government creation of money through the central banks, open market operations, creating new money. We have to simply accept that's what a monetary system is about. Hello, Professor Chin. I'm Louis from Option B. I was in Kingston last yep. year. Yeah, I remember. Um, yep. I'm quite glad that you mentioned Giselle because I wanted to ask you a question about uh, complementary currency systems because actually what we want for financial stability is first some kind of credit caution that which would be similar to the Via Frank in Switzerland, if yeah. you agree, if you know about it. So uh, what do you think about that kind of macroeconomic complementary currency schemes mm. in terms of financial stability? And linked to that, what do you think about the Nikki Foros and Zeta uh, proposal for Greece? Namely, a complementary currency linked to an employer of last resort plan for yeah. Greece for Greek recovery. And another question linked to that would be, we want second that debt don't accumulate. But I'm quite sceptical on these, the macro application of a Brazilian money because we need money as a means of payment. So what, do you, what would you think about downscaling monetary systems to, to relocate to re them? If it's mm. something to have some very local forms of finance, especially in view of the, of the ecological transition for monetary stability? Yeah, good, good questions. Uh, I'm in favour of the complementary currency systems certainly in Europe, because that's an antidote to the insa insanity of the controls on the creation of the euro, okay? And particularly in Greece, but also Italy. I think Italy's more likely to do it ahead of Greece because Italy's politically stronger. It can get away with it. You can create a tax credit system. My good friend Trun Andresen, who's a systems engineer, has done a lot of work on this. I recommend looking at Trun's work, Trun Andresen, A-N-D-R-E-S-E-N, on complementary currencies. And they do work because, as we saw with the example of Wargall, they enable transactions to occur which wouldn't occur once the credit system is broken down. It clearly has broken down uh, in, in Europe uh, again. So that, I think, complementary currencies play an essential role. Um, whether they work on a grand scale, I mean, I, I, I haven't actually modelled the Gazellian system properly, but I think if you, that was the only monetary system that existed, uh, you could potentially make that function very effectively. Uh, there will always be people trying to get it to be abolished because they want to accumulate money. Okay? That, that's the, the political desire to accumulate. 
as Marx put it brilliantly, accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets, quote unquote. Um, so that is always a danger, but I think a non-accumulating form of money is, import is an important thing to try to achieve because when you look at what's happened to the velocity of money, take a look at what's called the velocity of MZM, money of zero maturity, using the St. Louis Fred database. You'll see it was about below, just below two, uh, right through the 50s and 60s, that's as far as they take the data back, rose dramatically during the inflationary period up to the Volcker recession. With the Volcker recession, plunged from 3.5 to about two again, and now with the, uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, with the level of private debt we have, its money is only turning over about one, pretty close to once a year. Now, I think a huge part of that is people are hoarding it, trying to repay their debt. But when you hoard money, you don't create money. You slow down its rate of turnover, you slow down GDP. So I think a huge part of our problems in that sense ro rise from the fact we've accumulated so much debt that people are trying to accumulate money to pay it, which means they're not spending, which is a major reason why the economy has slowed down. So um, we need to do something in the direction of Gazelle, Gazelle's ideas. And I agree there's potential problems. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'm Christian from Ocean C, which is development macroeconomics and finance, I would say. And uh, you were t I was just like getting curious about one sentence you just said in your presentation, which is that debt doesn't grow out. And um, I'm not sure if you regarded it to to what I see, or like if you just regarded it to, to private debt, because like I think in the U U.S. right now there's this big discussion about, okay, should we actually increase our debt or not, and how's it going? I think also with some um, like with uh, Paul Krugman, for example, talking about it. And there was the argument put forward that, okay, growth is higher than the interest rate in in US. All the last, I don't know, like how many, um, like, yeah, I mean, how many years, but with a, sh a short episode in the 80s where um, interest rate has been higher, but, and the, the rest of the time not. So they were actually making the point that uh, that does grow out and that, um, yeah, like the the, Debt to GDP ratio is decreasing over time while the economy is growing. So I just wonder why you were stating this other point. Or well, was it? They're wrong. <laughs> this is the this is the most recent American data. Um, you see that the debt is not falling. This is the level of private debt compared to GDP. It started to rise from 2015 a bit. Um, it's fallen slightly, uh, but it's it, but just recently. But there's no way that's being grown out of. I and mean, if you go back and do the um, the long run. Uh, data series that I've that, you had, that I showed you there beforehand, uh, where it's still the level of private debt compared to GDP that exceeds the peak during the Great Depression caused by deflation. There's no way America's growing out of its private debt level. Uh, if, if you if you get back to here, then I'd agree with the argument. Okay. Now the data, by the way, the, I've, I've had to imply the data back here. I've had two overlapping time series with vastly different values, but the, tr the trends being exactly the same. So I've overlapped them to derive a data series back to 1830. But you can see from that point, the talk that America is growing out of debt is just garbage. Okay. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm Niels from uh, the development option of EPOC. And uh, I have a question more technical. And uh, what do you think about the attempts to model uh, financial instability? And it's linked to different markets, especially exchange currency markets, um, uh, through behavioral finance in macroeconomic models, instead of going through a Minskyan uh, perspective. On yeah. Um, behavioral finance is, is non-threatening to neoclassical economists because they can sit through an entire presentation of behavioural finance and say, that's just too complicated, let's simplify and assume rational expectations. And I've seen plenty of examples like that. I sat through a conference uh, uh, the NISR ran recently uh, on this whole idea of psychology and economics and some good papers were done, some very good research presented and so on. But I was thinking, how would a neoclassical be reacting to this? And all these biases that are supposed to exist. Um, you know, this bias, that bias. I think the last count, there's about 160 of them. Uh, a neoclassical look at those things, oh, let's, let's just simplify and assume everybody's rational, by which they mean everybody can predict the future accurately, if you look at how they define the word rational. Um, so to me, it's a dead end, because it will not lead to any effective modelling. Um, 
And if you look at people who've tried to do multi-agent models, I've got two students doing, uh, one who's finished, one who's completing a PhD right now in multi-agent modeling. Incredibly sophisticated work, very, very hard, and at the end of it, they've done one-tenth of what they thought they'd do. Uh, it is just really, really hard to do multi-agent modeling properly, particularly if you try to include all the various complexities of behavior we know actually exist. Um, so I think we've over-exaggerated the importance of behavior in the economy and under-considered the importance of structure. And that's why I've shown those models that say I can simply say wages will rise, there's a positive relationship between wages and employment, there's a positive relationship between uh, investment and profits, and just sit with that and out of that I can derive the, the great moderation and the great recession without needing to get very complicated about behaviour. So I think we've, we've exaggerated the importance of behaviour and not considered structure enough. And e even in an attempt like uh, Mark Lavois did uh, in 2011, I think, not using um, agent-based model and agent expectations, but like building rather more meso-economic functions yeah. with it. I'd rather do the macro work that Mark and I do than the, than the multi-agent modelling, definitely. Uh, I think one of the problems is how complex this stuff gets to be over time and how the, the argument that neoclassicals can make back is you're just ad hoc, okay? And that's one reason I said, well, what's the best reply to ad hocery? You say, okay, let's work from strictly und undebatable definitions. And what I've shown is, uh, I did this in retrospect. I, when I built my Minsky model, I used Goodwin's growth cycle model. And then I realized some years later that the growth cycle model in terms of the wages share and the employment rate boiled down to absolutely undeniable verbal statements. You know, wages, wages share will rise if, if wage growth exceeds labour productivity plus, um, plus population growth. I thought, well, it must be something like that for debt. And debt with the debt equation was much more complicated. And I went through and reworked and I sort of said, well, duh, what it says is the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Now that's absolutely undeniable statement. You put those together, you get the dynamics I showed you in those models. So to me, the, we do need sound macro foundations for macroeconomics. Those macro foundations are the definition of the macro economy, rather than obsessing about the behavior of individuals all that much. It's, and we have to we think in terms of social classes, and one way you can think about the sonnenschein mandrell de Brewer theorem, the conclusion you can't derive a demand curve from neoclassical principles, is that you have to think in terms of social classes. And that was Alan Kerman's observation back in the 90s. I stole the subtitle of debunking economics from Alan, who's a good friend, so he doesn't mind, uh, you know, saying that the naked emperor. Okay? So the naked emperor pointed that we must think in terms of aggregates above the level of individuals. And social classes are what the classical school did, and we need to go back to that. And fundamentally, you then have behaviours related to social class. And that is sufficient to build a, a sophisticated model of capitalism without needing all the overlay of behavioural psychology. Uh, okay, good day. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Joram from studying in Option B, also Microeconomics and Finance, mm -hmm. and originally from Germany. My question was very, very similar to that, so um, I just maybe ask another one, but to clarify, uh, so your, found, uh, your stance on microeconomics is uh, on, mi on micro foundations is um, to not do them at all, or does it make a difference if you use environmentally consistent behavior, or you mentioned ad hoc behavioral or mm. pseudo behavioralism? But I think you said enough about it. So I luckily had a second question, which was um, rooted from the last presentation I saw from you, which was uh, at Exploring Economics Summer School in, in Germany, mm -hmm. and you mentioned a PhD students student of yours who um, used uh, your platform, Minsky, your, mm -hmm. your program to model um, the whole of uh, Portugal's economy. Yep. So I just wanted to ask how, how that is going um, with, your, with your program, if you have advanced or if your PhD students have advanced. Yeah, I mean, that's, works, that's, that's um, uh, Pedro Pratas, who's working in the, in the statistical department of uh, the Portuguese government. It's progressing brilliantly. Um, he's doing... Uh, I've still got to extend the capacities of Minsky to support the work that he's doing. Um, let's see, let's show the latest version of the model here. Um, and some of the hassles are that the, there is the model. Um, uh, I'm not sure, this is, a, this is a, an old, earlier version, it'll, it'll do anyway, let's see if it loads. Okay, now part of the, there are problems just in terms of how Minsky's laid out right now. Uh, because look, if I go to that scale, 
um, it's just impossible to read that model, okay? The reason is that he's got to dump everything in, in a visual screen. Uh, so all the, but all these things here are largely definitions. All the <laughs> dynamics is occurring <coughs> through what's defined in the godly tables. <coughs> Pardon me. Oh, hang on. Why is that not? <coughs> so the basic logic is just talking about what the financial flows are. And if what I want to do is have a, the, 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 the program creates all the equations for you. I want to make it two way. So you write the equations, they can be used on the canvas rather than having to write them on the canvas. And then I could get rid of all this stuff here in the middle that's just definitions and make the model much more um, understandable. But in terms of accuracy of modeling, uh, Pedro's model outperforms every model of the, in terms of out, of out of sample forecasting, every formal model in the Portuguese economy. Okay? And this is, he did it as a master's degree paper. So just using the, st the structure of the economy, getting the flows right, using the godly tables to be able to make sure you've got stock flow consistency, uh, and then doing some empirical work to fit the data as well. Uh, yeah, he's, he's out doing any neoclassical model, hands down. And um, I've added a couple of features to the program now to make it easy to use. You'll notice bookmarks up here. So you can create a bookmark and place all the equations in one bookmark, all the graphs somewhere else and so on. Uh, he, that, this hasn't implied that in this older version of the, of the model. Uh, and it's, therefore, it's impossible to read the graphs and so on. But you, it is capable now of modelling a national economy quite effectively. What I want to add to it over time is multi-sectoral capabilities. At the moment, you've got to work in terms of a scale of value for GDP and so on. I want to be able to break that down and have multi-sectoral godly tables effectively enab enabling multi-sectoral modelling. And hopefully, I'm going to get the financing this year to start doing that. But yeah, it's certainly well and truly capable. Nowhere near as many fatal bugs as it used to have. Still plenty of bugs but not the fatal stuff that used to get in the way beforehand. So um, I do recommend getting it and having a play with it. And drag Pedro up here to give a, a paper. He'd be excellent to show what you can do with Minsky. He, he, he did what I didn't believe was possible with Minsky because I thought it's not yet capable of modelling a real economy. And then he didn't know that, so he did it for his master's degree. Yeah. Thank you also from me for your presentation. I'm uh, Philip from uh, Germany originally and studying in option C. Um, indeed, my question goes back to the first part of your presentation, mm -hmm. to the production functions. Yeah. And um, yeah, if we were to uh, model more realistically the economic production process, I agree that integrating energy is, is um, useful and interesting and also, as you showed, quite easy to, to do as it has a common unit, the, the joule. Um, but shouldn't, then, shouldn't we then at the same time also try to, um, at the output side, next to GDP, um, include the, what ecological economists call joint production or waste? Mm. Shouldn't we try to include um, uh, these joint or waste products in the, in the whole economic process as well? Or are they too heterogeneous to, to model? Because, sure, taking as an input unit joule, but then we have output and then we have nuclear waste, we have chemical waste, yeah. we have atmospheric waste and so on. How, what is yeah. your opinion? Uh, again, the idea is to, is to, it's a very good question. The idea is with the energy work is to be, be, build models which are linked to ecological economic models right from the very outset. Because if you have energy as your input, then you necessarily have waste energy as one of your outputs. And in fact, real output is less than the waste output, again, by the second law of thermodynamics. So the trouble is the energy waste the energy as production takes material forms. So we, we use energy to transform matter into other forms of matter. Okay? This, this part of this was lumps of, um, uh, what's it called? Well, not aluminum, but uh, um, yeah, aluminium, iron ore, et cetera, et cetera. It's been transformed to a different form. The same thing applies with waste. Rather than waste energy, which gets radiated into outer space fairly easily, it's waste matter which is created by that process. The fundamentally important one at the moment is carbon dioxide, but the other waste ones that matter are the, dem and, and we, we're all, is, is, uh, you know, we, we're damaging the capacity of the planet to reabsorb the waste we generate in general by damaging uh, waste sinks and so on. So you would need to break it down to about, I think about seven different products 
before you'd be able to say, I've got an adequate model of the overall impact we're having on the ecology via the economy. And that again requires a multi-sectoral version of Minsky to do that, but it also requires the mathematics involved. What are the energy to matter transformations that are part of production? What are the energy matter transformations that are part of pollution? And that's work I hope to do with, my, with, my, with uh, Tim Garrett, who's a leading atmospheric physicist, and Matthias Griselli, who's a leading mathematician in the next year or two. But again, it's open slather. There's a huge amount of work to be done in that area, and it won't be done by the neoclassicals. Um, hello, thanks for your presentation. I'm Matheus from Option B, International Economics and Governance, uh, originally from Brazil. Uh, we were introduced uh, by uh, what your writings and your theories, um, at least me, and from, from one course that we have here. And um, I would like, uh, you were introduced to the critic made by Professor Lavoie for your statements, your declarations, regarding the, how we should reshape uh, and reconsider how we, uh, how we, we calculate and, uh, aggregate demand and national income. And I would like to, I'm, I was wondering what would be your reply to the critics made. I didn't quite follow the, the question, but this um, your rep Well, that's what I covered. That's why I covered it in that presentation because I, I hope you don't have any critiques of this definition of aggregate demand using the more tables. Do you? I, I don't know. I would need to think about it. Yeah, this was uh, this was this was in my reply. <coughs> this is in my reply to you, Mark, and, and then the second thing. I, I I definitely made some errors in how I stated it in the very first instance. You're quite right. Um, and this is what partly research is about. And the trouble is, in some ways, these days, because of the internet, we do our research very much in public. Whereas you make mistakes and pass it to be in a paper, you can ignore the paper, now it's on the internet, so you're stuck with it. But yes, I made errors in stating, initially I'd say aggregate demand is GDP plus change in debt. Now it's not, it's, it's turnover of existing money plus change in debt. The question is, do we measure turnover of existing money? No. Can we measure it fundamentally? No, because it's mixed with the creation of new money. But as a rough proxy, because most of the change in debt now is financing asset purchases, which don't turn up in GDP, then you can use it as a proxy, roughly speaking. But the eg exactly accurate statement is that aggregate demand is a turnover of existing money plus credit. And that, that I'm mathematically 100% correct. Plus also, uh, this includes gross financial transactions as well. So you can resolve that argument. And again, making mistakes and getting them corrected by critics coming back, but the insight being correct ends up with an improvement in the, in the logic. And that's part of the evolution of a school of economic thought. So this particular argument I'm showing here, uh, that's why they use symbolic logic to do it. Also, by the way, I think it's extremely important to think in terms of continuous time. This is one part of Mark, Mark and I've had a debate over this one and we still haven't resolved this one. Uh, a lot of the post-Keynesian model uses discrete time. I'm a big critic of that from a whole range of points of view. Mathematically, there's a large difference between the mathematics of discrete time systems and continuous time systems. Uh, the main problem I have with discrete time is that people are lazy. If you're going to do discrete time, discrete time do it properly. Discrete time means you think there's T minus X, uh, there's a lag of X in terms of your time units between one behaviour and another. Consumption, okay, I consume last week's income. Investment, I don't invest on last week's GDP, I invest on last year's GDP. So I was going to discrete time properly, I'd need to say okay, 50, I need a 52 unit uh, period, so T minus 52 would be investment decisions, and T minus 1 would be consumer decisions. And then if I found it was actually T minus 59 by empirical work rather than 52, I'd need to rewrite all the equations because all my time lags would be wrong, which we never do. Now, well, you can do exactly the same thing in continuous time by saying there's a time constant. And you might use a time constant of 1 for investment and 0 0.02 for consumption. And if you find you've got to change, you've got to change one scalar, not the entire thing. Plus also, logically thinking about this, I think one of the reasons we took so long to reach this resolution in post-Keynesian economics 
is that in discrete time it's really, really hard to put this together. Uh, another great friend, uh, 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 Giuseppe Fontana, uh, who's based at Leeds University, he made the point that everything seems to happen between the periods. Okay? I've forgotten the paper he made that point in, but it's a very good point. Because, because you had to take expectations or everything as happening within a period and then everything within the next period, he said the important changes seem to occur between the periods. And that's a, that's a failing of thinking in discrete time. And when you think in continuous time, it's all happening continuously. So this is, all, this is an expression in terms of continuous time logic. And I, again, very, very emphatic. I think with, we have to abandon discrete time thinking and start thinking in terms of continuous time to get over those sorts of logical conundrums and to be able to build models which are tractable because, I mean, Wynn at one stage, one of his papers, said he brought a couple of time lags in to avoid simultaneous determination. And I remember I, when I first did my, my PhD, I tried to model a, uh, a monetary corn economy and I was doing it in discrete time. And I had a set of equations and I, I, I was not going to make it that workers' consumption is based on workers' income in the previous year. Forget it, okay? I wasn't going to make that mistake. So I got a set of equations where workers' consumption is based on the income now. And then I tried to build and had to build, this is using a mathematical program to do all the, the logic, this is MathCAD. And I finally started printing out the equations they covered my basement. Okay? Because of that problem of, of, of continuous time, of discrete time determination. In continuous time, it's, it's the equations I've shown you are basically the same logic. Okay? So there's a huge advantage in working in continuous time. That means learning differential equations properly and it means learning complex systems properly. And I think that's essential for the progress of post-Keynesian economics. Well, uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to answer that point, but I just want to say that uh, you'll be happy to know that Duménil and Lévy are more or less uh, following the same idea as yours, which is that aggregate demand is uh, strongly influenced by uh, credit, Good. credit flow. In fact, uh, because they're writing a new book, and Duménil and Lévy are the ones who will be presenting at the very last uh, joint seminar here. Uh, yeah, and they do have uh, in the simplest, uh, their simplest models at the beginning of their book, they, they have equations similar to yours. Good. Uh, but on the other hand, they're using uh, discrete time. <laughs> okay. um, yes, hello, my name is Sophie, I'm from Option B and I'm German. And I have to follow up on um, Francesca's question on Brexit. Um, yeah. And I, you can say that my question will be very German and I just want to say I see all the deficits and all the points you raised uh, with regards to the problems of the European Union and the Euro. I just wonder, because we're in a policy master, what's your alternative? Because it's always easy to say, oh, it doesn't work, let's abandon it. But mm. what would you implement instead f as a concept for Europe? Mm. And is a national a resort to national policies at this point where we're reverting to con uh, conservatism? I mean, we have Macron, for example, in France, who is very liberal, um, which now is a bit changed through the year, or like Gilles Jean tried to change, but I don't think in the long run that that will really change his course. Mm. So I wonder, yeah, what would you do instead? I'd go to back to national currencies. I think going from the ECU to the euro was a mistake, um, not only because of the way the euro has been managed, but even the idea of one currency across such a very vastly different con uh, continent. Nobody would ever propose, imagine a pro pro proposing a, an ASIO, <laughs> okay? An Asian currency, linking Cambodia with China. Nobody would do it, okay? It's only the, historical, the history of Europe that led to the idea of Europe being a good idea because it was seen as a part of stopping the Germans and the French fighting each other, okay? Yeah, now, and that uh, exactly uh, this political spirit of Europe, uh, isn't it worth preserving? I think it's making the Europeans and French fight, it, the Germans and French fight each other again. I think if I d identify the major factor causing friction between nations right now, it's the euro. Okay? So I think your project was hijacked, partly by the auto liberal philosophy that dominated it, uh, but also by the fact that you know, this is the, one, the, one of the, the only time in my life I'm going to agree with Milton Friedman. There's too much cultural and economic diversity in Europe to make a single currency sensible unless you have a national 
a, a continental government which is far more powerful than any of the, any of the national governments here. Fundamentally, America's situation. If somebody moves from Alabama to, to, to California, they continue getting their welfare payments paid by Washington. Okay? Now, if you move from Portugal to the UK, you go from your welfare payments being paid by Portugal to paying by the UK. And that is a huge source of friction, which leads people who are you know, workers to be at each other's throats over this whole thing, because they're the ones who end up in the doll queues, not the millionaires. And they're the ones who see Polish people in front of them and get racist about it. I, I think it's a huge source of the political conflict we're seeing in Europe today, is the Euro. And let's, let, let's I'd like humanity for once to be say, oh dear, we made a mistake, let's change. Let's go back, wouldn't that be good? Um, my name is Louisa. <coughs> I'm from the development track. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for this class. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much interested in inequality and distribution. In which one? Inequality and distribution yeah. issues. And um, I think the recent literature in inequality is, it has empirical findings that are quite interesting, but at the same time, they have a very poor understanding of um, macro theory and the structures behind it. Mm. But at the same time, when you go to macro theories, I, I still think they neglect distribution mm. um, to a very large extent. So I think there is a poor understanding of the macro foundations behind um, distribution and of its consequences, mm. um, especially when you compare with production and demand, which we spend so much time understanding its mm. complexity. I think distribution is really neglected. And yeah, I think sometimes we integrate it with this oversimplification of class struggle or I also think we neglect the whole role of credit in this and how mm. distribution changes. And I would like to know from you, how do you see that? I think the fact that this is very politically embedded and you cannot understand distribution without politics makes it much harder and I think that's why we avoid it so much. But at the same time, I think it's un inevitable if you want to have a, a rigorous understanding of the economy to have a real understanding of the distribution. And I don't see that in heterodox or mainstream economics at all. Yeah. Um, again, very good question. I just want to illustrate that the role of distribution and de debt and distribution together and the need to think in terms of different social classes. Um, and this is one of the things that, uh, that, that I've got an accidental godly table, let's get rid of it. Um, this is one thing which Graziani made a uh, Graziani made a very good case about in his monetary circuit papers that you can't fold firms into banks, you must treat them as separate. That also says you can't fold capitalists into bankers, you've got to treat them as separate social classes. Now this is one thing again which I found out just by exploring my, my Minsky model uh, and looking back at Marx because my Minsky, if you look at Goodwin's inspiration for building Goodwin's model in 67, it was to, to model the verbal model of a trade cycle he found in Marx in chapter 25 of Volume 1 of Capital, uh, written in 18, published in 1867. So it was a centenary present for Marx. And it, he got that whole idea of a cycle. Empirically, it's been confirmed, by the way, by uh, uh, Grisselli and I've forgotten the, the second researcher. There's a paper in the Cambridge Journal of Economics by David Harvey saying it's empirically crit critiqued. That is a bad paper, and David acknowledges it because he made a simple, he, he literally called it to me a simple school by error. Uh, he, had it, he had numbers worked out in decimals and he converted to percentages and forgot to convert back. So his numbers are out by a factor of 100. Okay? So the paper you'll see in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, which I was referee for, and, and I passed because the table of data looked convincing and so on. When I tried to graph the numbers for the Phillips curve, I got these crazy graphs. And I wrote to David saying, what's going on here? And he said, I made a simple schoolboy error. Okay? So uh, Matthias, who is a good friend, uh, uh, Matthias Griselli, went and checked up and did the empirical work. And the Goodwin cycle fits the data of the 10 OECD countries that Harvey said it didn't fit. So the Goodwin model itself, which is derived from Marx, is a very good foundation. Now, of course, that divides the world into workers and capitalists, which gives you income distribution. But with only the two classes, if one goes up, the other necessarily goes down. When you include the third class of bankers, there's one more degree of freedom. 
And what you can have is when you, when you work out the mathematics, again Marx was right in 1867. He, in doing his verbal model, he ended up saying to put it mathematically, the workers, effectively the workers' share of GDP is the dependent, not the independent variable. The independent variable is the desire to invest by capitalists. He was spot on with that. Now when you put it in a three-class model, again this is an emergent property I did not build into the model, it simply came out of the dynamics. When you put it together, even though I have the firms borrowing the money, the impact of the rising level of private debt falls on workers' share of GDP. So a higher level of debt means a lower level of workers' share of GDP. Very straight income distribution implication coming out of that. Secondly, when, you have a, when the level of debt stabilises, then so does the distribution of income. Okay? When the level of debt continues to rise, income distribution gets worse and leads to a breakdown. That's what I've, I demonstrated very quickly with that uh, simulation earlier. I'll do it again. I, I could include in this graph the distribution of income by having workers, capitalists and bankers' incomes there. But this is now the simulation with um, just the uh, a low level of desire to invest by capitalists which leads to a convergence and a stabilisation in the distribution of income. Notice you get a low level of debt out of that. That's why I put a maximum of three on the graph for the, for the debt level. Uh, if I now change that and I put in the, the higher level of desire to invest by capitalists, which is a positive thing. You would like them to have a higher level of desire to invest. But in the financial system we have that leads to a higher accumulation of debt a lower rate of growth and ultimately a breakdown. This is now the same simulation and you can see the difference in the debt level. <coughs> okay? And you can also see by implication what's going to happen with distribution of income because wages share is falling and the debt level is rising. Okay? So there's distribution, we can build distribution into our macroeconomic models if we work at the level of social classes and include bankers as a separate social classes to work to, to capitalists. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Keen, for your presentation. I'm Martin. I'm from uh, the Development Option, and I come from Belgium. Uh, I came a bit late today, so I'm sorry. Maybe I uh, wouldn't need to ask if I was there in time. But so, at the beginning of your presentation, when you were trying to reintegrate into the basic equation through which we model the economy, things such as energy and mm -hmm. matter to make them match with thermodynamics, um, I wonder what is um, from an epistemological point of view, um, how do we, so that means basically we were integrating uh, things that are scarce into uh, our vision of the economy and somehow does not uh, lead us back to a allocate scarce resources assumption and I, I wonder how challenging is that for from a post keynesian point of view where we've always been contending that this assumption is misleading uh, to describe uh, a capitalist economy. So basically I'd like to hear more on that. How do we reintegrate natural scarcity uh, into a post keynesian view of the economy in order to cope with... The no notion of scarcity? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think scarcity is a misnomer. Capitalism's problem is abundance, not scarcity. And with the whole intellectual framework that neoclassical economics has given us has totally distorted the nature of the real world. I think the best writing on this is done by Janos Kornai and what he called demand-constrained versus resource-constrained economies. Uh, I think it was a brilliant insight and really highly worth reading because he said if you look at a, a Soviet economy and imagine a, imagine a perfect Soviet economy, no Stalin, okay, everything being done for the benefit of the workers, uh, wanting to develop. He said in that sort of society, your plan, your five-year plan, would try to allocate scarce resources to all the various sectors because the resources are scarce, all the sectors would get less of the inputs than they actually need. So nobody could actually completely fulfill the plan. So the easiest way to reach the plan would be to not innovate, continue producing last year's output in more volume. And you'd always be living at the resource constrained edge. He said in a capitalist economy, you have a multitude, you couldn't give a shit about the workers, but you need them to buy stuff off you. Uh, you've got a range of companies competing to get hold of the limited demand. There's an excess capacity for supply. Normally, cap capitalist economies have got at least 10%, often 20% spare capacity. That's because firms are investing for a growing economy, so there's no point building a factory which just meets today's demand. You've got to have factor in at least 10 years of growth. 
So when your factory starts, it's going to be about maybe 50% capacity. Then you also want to have competitive capacity to take advantage of any stuff ups by your competitors. If you don't have that spare capacity and somebody produces a tyre that explodes, then you can't sell into that market created by the failure of one of your competitors. So mark, capital is marked by excess capacity. So how do you ensure as an individual capitalist you get as much as you can of that excess capacity? You have to innovate. Now I, I, I got a wonderful personal cameo of this. I mentioned I think in debunking economics when my uh, a girl, my a girl, a girlfriend's brother wanted to buy a 650cc motorbike. That's what, well, that was when 650cc was really big. Okay, now you get 1.4, but litre, but 650cc. And he couldn't afford a Kawasaki or a Yamaha or a Honda, but he found he could buy a Cossack for 650 Australian dollars. When the, the going price for a 650cc uh, Kawasaki was about $3,000. So he, we all, he ordered a Cossack and I helped him unpack it. It arrived in a crate, a wooden crate. We took the wooden crate off. That we then saw these ra oil soaked rags over this thing which has been bolted down on another wooden platform. Pulled the bolts off, took off the rags and beneath that rag was this 1942 BMW. Have you ever seen the movie The Great Escape where Steve McQueen I think gets off on a motorbike and jumps the fence at some point? Exactly the same bike with a bicycle seat. Okay? Okay? So the Cossack in 1972 was a 1942 BMW. The, that's, that's a resource constrained economy. That's a scarcity economy. Okay? But capitalism is a demand constrained economy. Abundant capacity to create. So that's part of the whole analysis we need to turn upside down as well. And Cornei's work is extremely important and has been neglected and should be incorporated in post-Keynesian work in future. Okay, so uh, I wanted to ask other questions, but I want to bounce back on Martin's comment and your question. Actually, uh, your answer still seems in a capitalist world. Okay. Namely, uh, your answer still applies to a capitalist world. Yeah. But what if we need to transition to something else? I think due to physical constraints, we will have at some point, we, we will have some kind of strategy, some, some, some kind of rationing. I, mean, I think that's going to happen in the coming century. Yeah. And so the question is, is how do we organize planning? Uh, because that, that's what we will have to do at some point. Yeah. I, mean, you, you can't, I mean, within the capitalist economy, we are demand constraints. But at some point, supply constraints will come. The physical, yeah. I mean, not economic. Yeah, I can see us being in a, in a very militaristic world in the next 50 years. Because if you look at what's going to happen in the scale, the scale of climate breakdown I think we face is enormous. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues working in this area and they are terrified. Uh, what they're getting, what comes through at the IPCC level is far um, more sanitised than what's being worried about by real climate scientists doing research. For example, one of my colleagues uh, is, a, is, is one of the world's experts on soil. And he says on, if they extrapolate the rate of decay of topsoil, then we have 30 years before we run out of it. Okay? That's probably less than, I think it was a conversation we had about, was about eight, ten years ago. Now, that's the rate at which we're degrading the capacity of the planet to reproduce itself for our, for our benefit. Um, and when we realise how bad that is, um, and, and we finally have a crisis which even Donald Trump has to admit is caused by climate change, uh, and then realise just how serious the threat we face, then we're going to have to propose rationing. We, we, we can't, as a lot of people I've seen arguing, with people to be allocated from, from manufacturing to getting energy. We're, not, we're unnecessary. We can't do that. It's not labour that does it, it's machinery. Uh, we're going to have to drastically reduce energy consumption of virtually everything except creating energy systems that don't generate excessive carbon and trying to extract it from the atmosphere. That implies a rationing society and dramatic controls on what can and can't be done, which is, implies a militaristic society. So I, see, I strongly see that as our future. The ultimate only way to avoid this in the very long term, and I'm talking less than a century, Okay, and this is going to sound like I'm a space cadet, and in some ways I am, is taking production off planet. Okay, which we're just beginning to develop the capability to do. If I told you a century ago you'd be flying from Sydney to, a, to London in one trip, you'd laugh at me. In four or five years' time, that'll be a regular flight. Okay? 
over a century period, we could take manufacturing off planet. And the one thing, the first planet we have to terraform is the Earth, once we realize the damage we've done to it. But in the transition, I can see enormous dislocation, massive rationing, and militaristic societies being more successful than ones that attempt to be democratic. That's a charming film point, isn't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>